Now I approach my task here today with humility, not only because of the sterling qualities of the scholars on this panel and in this room, but also because after viewing the recent uh, PBS documentary, Looking for Lincoln, hosted by Henry Louis Gates Jr., it's hard to escape the idea that a random group of Chicago high school students can be more insightful on racism, slavery, and war than some of our most distinguished historians. It is with this cautionary note firmly in mind that I proceed. In her valuable book, Cold War Civil Rights, Mary Ditschak performed a useful service in reminding us that the agonized retreat from white supremacy in the United States beginning roughly in May 1954 was driven decidedly by the global correlation of forces in the Cold War specifically. How could Washington credibly charge Moscow with human rights violations when an egregious form of bigotry persisted on these shores? Jim Crow had to go as a result. But that was not the only matter that changed for the Cold War, which in many ways was a global struggle against left-wing radicalism, has led inexorably to a weakening of working class organizations that could conceivably protect and enhance the class status of a black community that is overwhelmingly working class. The inevitable result has been the spectacular decline in black wealth as a direct result of the current economic downturn to the point where it is long past time to question severely the fateful decision to accept the Faustian bargain that led some in the civil rights movement to acquiesce to anti-communism. Kevin Gaines, in his exceedingly thoughtful paper, raises the powerful point that Washington was hesitant about the idea of the descendants of enslaved Africans on these shores adopting an idea of transnational citizenship. In the remarks that follow, I will seek to expand upon these two interlinked notions, how the global correlation of forces drove the domestic agenda on racism, and likewise, how blacks in, in the United States, the country now known as the United States, recognized this early on in response, adopted a conception of transnational citizenship that only began to dissipate when formal US citizenship was granted in the 1960s. Historians of the future may well conclude that this trade-off, exchanging transnational citizenship for US citizenship, may have been necessary in the 1960s, but with the precipitous decline of the United States that the 21st century entails, along with the rise of transnational forces and movements, movements around climate change, globalization, the G20, United Nations, the notion of universal jurisdiction, which may lead to the impending indictment in Spain of your former US Attorney General, uh, this trade-off may well need to be reconsidered. Certainly, it is fair to say that the times demand a new narrative, what is now called African American history, that recognizes that other than the struggles of our peoples themselves, it is the global correlation of forces that has been the decisive factor in shaping our destiny. And further, when one places the black experience in a global context, it forces one to not only consider the status of the African in North America, but as well reconsider the very legitimacy of the nation now known as the United States of America. In other words, the story of the founding of the United States is in, in, is in um, desperate need of serious revision. This is nothing new. Uh, we're all familiar with Lord Dunsmore's proclamation in 18th century Virginia that promised freedom to the enslaved in return for alignment with London <clears throat> against the rebelling colonists. In the event more the enslaved fought alongside the redcoats than the rebels, then moved on after London's defeat to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and other locales. And as Harvey and Monty Whitfield instructs us in his recent book, Blacks Along the Border, continued to press abolitionist demands on the newly minted United States of America. The idea that enslaved Africans might not be on board with the US project, which after all, designated them as the mud seals of society, was recognized at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, where founding father George Mason reminded his fellow delegates that the evils of having slaves was experienced during the late war. Had slaves been treated as they might have been by the enemy, he said, they would have proved dangerous instruments in their hands. He adverted to history and recalled the dangerous insurrections of the slaves in Greece and Sicily, and the instructions given by the temporarily triumphant Oliver Cromwell to the commissioner sent to Virginia in the 17th century to arm the servants and slaves to keep the colonists in line. As the new nation evolved, the newly constructed USA quickly came to recognize that not only were the enslaved population highly susceptible to revolt, 
But perhaps worse, they were not above aligning with the most determined foes of the young state. The scholar Eugene uh, Genovese, in his still enlightening volume, uh, From Rebellion to Revolution, Afro-American Slave Revolts and the Making of the Modern World, tells us, quote, British, British officials in Jamaica sent messages to London in 1730-31, warning that an expected Spanish invasion would have substantial and carefully prepared black help, unquote. In other words, London knew that the enslaved were willing to turn against their masters and lead with a foreign power, and thus were predisposed to turn this stratagem against the United States itself. Similarly, the Stono Revolt in neighboring colonial South Carolina takes place in the context of Spanish aid to escape slaves from British territory. Repeatedly, says Genovese, quote, the French incited the slaves of the British, who incited the slaves of the Spanish, who incited the slaves of the French, unquote. Yet bizarrely, perhaps to reinsure his mostly Euro-American readership, uh, Genovese concludes, quote, the slaves of the Old South experienced little or no exterior power except that of their masters, unquote. Later, Genovese observes that his fellow historian of slave sedition, Herbert Apthecker, has been criticized for exaggerations of revolts, but Genovese can be charged similarly in exaggerating the lack of support that enslaved Africans and North Americans receive from external forces. Genovese can be excused to the extent that historians have not paid sufficient attention to this potent factor, which has led some to think that what Duchiak and Gaines describe in their respective books is solely a phenomenon of the second half of the 20th century. Such a supposition hardly explains what occurred during the War of 1812 when thousands of the enslaved defected to the British side, not only donned red coats and proceeded to plunder Virginia and the Chesapeake, including up at the burn down Washington, D.C. in August 1814, but as well acted as spies, helping to guide the red coats to inviting targets. Thousands of the enslaved, akin to what occurred during the Revolutionary War, then proceeded to decamp to Halifax, Bermuda, and Trinidad, where their descendants continued to reside. This objective alliance between the enslaved and London, which is similar to the Cold War dynamic that Dutschiak writes about, is suggested by Christopher Leslie Brown in his informative book, Moral Capital, The Foundations of British Abolitionism, where he suggests that the acceleration of this powerful movement for reform in the UK was propelled in no small part by the perception in London that the North American Revolt in 1776 was led by slaveholders and the antebellum dominance of the White House by slaveholders from Virginia suggests further why this objective alliance between the enslaved and the British emerged. Indeed, the scholar Elisa Tamarkin, in her recently published book, Anglophilia, dealing with the United States, understandably and justifiably devotes considerable space to blanks, blacks in the United States, though Anglophobia was a trait that easily describes such leading personalities as Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun. Indeed, the Anglophilia of blacks in North America far surpasses subsequent sympathies for Moscow or Tokyo and better places the 20th century attachments in proper context. This Anglophilia amongst those of African descent in the United States did not abate as the War of 1812 was followed by constant friction between London and Washington, including threats of war in the 1840s. British legations in Charleston and Savannah and New Orleans were a precursor of the Ford Foundation in the 1960s in that they lobbied vigorously and funded, funded lawsuits against the Negro Seamen's Acts, which targeted and persecuted black sailors from the United States North and the Caribbean alike. During the same time of rising tension between London and Washington, the slave ship Creole headed, for Virgi headed from Virginia to New Orleans, but the Africans revolted, killed, and or detained the crew sailed into the Bahamas, where they were freed and allowed to decamp to Jamaica. This has been described as the most successful slave revolt in the history of the United States and moved Fred Frederick Douglass into his only venture into writing fiction. It's no accident that John Brown's raid was concocted in Canada, just as it's no coincidence that, a, that the Euro-Canadian, Alexander Milton Ross, was not only in Virginia at the time of this raid, seeking to effect a rescue of Brown's captured band, which included black Canadians, but before then had emulated Harriet Tubman by traveling repeatedly into the South to liberate enslaved Africans. Similarly, if you examine the 1837-1838 Republican revolt against British rule in Canada, you will find that descendants of enslaved Africans from the United States were the fiercest opponent of this rebellion and were relied upon heavily by Her Majesty as a result. 